Take a break and listen to the Bruce Collins show. Don't you dare look back, just keep your eyes on me. I said you're holding back. She said, Shut up, that's me. This woman is my destiny. She said, Ooh, ooh, shut up, and that's me. The new theater of the mind. So can we discuss that uh, in my contract, that uh, line 34, from now on, from now on the guests need to refer to me during the interviews as Oh Baron, my Baron. Yeah. Well, I don't care. That's in my contract now. Look, there's not going to be any disagreements about that. On the air. We're on the air right now. Welcome back to the Bruce Collins Show. We're very glad to have you join us. Tonight, we talk with a homicide detective who went from atheist to Christian after examining the evidence for himself. He is J. Warner Wallace, and his book is God's Crime Scene. The Bruce Collins Show airs every Thursday night at 10 p.m. on WWPR, 1490 a.m. You can also catch the show on Fridays at 10 p.m. Eastern Time online at ipbn-fm.com. That's ipbn-fm.com. Please tell your friends about The Bruce Collins Show, and you can join us on Facebook at the Bruce Collins Show page. You can also visit our website, thebrucecollinsshow.com. If you'd like to contact us, you can email us at bruce underscore collins underscore show at aol.com. The Bruce Collins Show also has a YouTube channel. Visit YouTube, search for The Bruce Collins Show channel, subscribe, and catch all the latest shows on YouTube. Now, a lot of people, they write to me through this email address, Bruce underscore Collins underscore show at AOL.com, and they say to me, tell us what you do outside of the program. Tell us what you do for fun. Okay, that's fair enough. So tonight, before the show, I went out to eat right here in Bradenton. I found a brand new restaurant that I want to recommend to all of our listeners. This is run by a, a brother team of chefs, and they're both dyslexic. The name of the restaurant is Sinner Sea D'Urved, and I had tonight a delicious chili flea steak. The only scary thing about the experience was I really don't know what I ate in English. And now let me introduce my co-host, Chad Miles. Chad is a former congressional candidate in Michigan and a military veteran and is the founder and webmaster at Conspiria.net and ZippyCheese.com. You can also find out more information on Chad at chadmiles.com. He is radio's lethal weapon, Chad the Odometer Miles. Hey, Chad, welcome back to the program. Hey, hey Bruce. What's on your mind, buddy? Hey, 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 Chad. I don't know. <laughs> what do you mean you don't know? I'm not a mind reader, Chad. Do you think I have ASAP? You mean ESP? ESP is that place that keeps calling me to help wayward dogs. No, you mean the ASPCA. Hey, I know what you just called me. I can spell. No, the, no, the ASPCA is an animal organization. Chad, you can't F-O-O-O-O-L me. <laughs> I'm not so sure about that. Hey, by the way, you have a couple of Star Wars quizzes on this zippycheese.com, don't you? Oh, uh, yeah, that's right. Well, let me ask you, who's your favorite Star Wars character? Oh, I'd, uh, probably C-3PO. Wait. You say the three people are mad at me? No, no. C-3PO is a Star Wars character. All these letters in the alphabet are really confusing me, Chad. Well, if we don't use letters, how can we speak? I don't mean letters for words. I mean all these letters that aren't words. Letters that aren't words? Oh, you mean acronyms. No, no, Chad. I mean letters that represent something like C-O-W. Cow is not an acronym. How do you know, Chad? Have you asked the cow? No. Oh, so you're saying that you're a mind reader now. If only you could read my mind, Bruce. The producer just sent me a note. Guess who's on the line right now? 
Oh, Colin S. Collins? He's not real. Uh, Jack O'Berry Sr. No. Oh, not Social Media Jones. As much as I'd like to get some more Social Media advice from that genius, Social Media Jones is not on the line right now, unfortunately. By the way, did you know that I received a survey from Social Media Jones' social media company? No, you didn't let me know that. Yeah, I did. They asked me to rate each question 1 to 100% to make sure they are meeting my social media needs. The first question had to do with whether or not Social Media Jones had the appropriate level of razzmatazz, which I thought was a pretty important question. So I actually split up the word. I gave Social Media Jones... 140% on Raz, but only 95% Mataz. So, in my opinion, Social Media Jones needs to raise his level of Metazbolism. Okay, Bruce, you do realize that if you grade above 100%, you're causing the whole survey to be invalid, right? That's what they want you to think. So, if Colin Jekyllberry Sr. and Social Media Jones are not on the line, I give up. Who is it? It's Gabe Reed, also known as the Gregarious One. He's our co-host on the big finale, which airs Mondays at 10 p.m. Eastern Time on IPBN-FM.com. Oh, yeah, I remember him. Me too. Barely. Hey, Gabe, how's it shaking? Hey, what's going on, Bruce and Chad? So, Gabe, tell me about the events that led up to you contacting us about the Bruce Collins Show. Something about you heard something on a a recent program, right? Uh, So I was listening to your February 18th show with David Limbaugh and uh, that senior Pickles and Colin S. Collins hacking into the show. What was that about, Bruce? I don't know. I I heard something about that, too. People have been telling me that, the listeners, but, you know, I don't know how to access our show. Well, you might want to work on that. Also, they mentioned some guy, Roosevelt Jackson, the fake uh, Bigfoot hunter. Fake? Yeah, I had Roosevelt Jackson on recently on the show, and uh, a lot of people thought there was something weird about him, but I just considered him an expert. But, uh, yeah, let's – actually, you sent the producer – a segment of that February 18th show. And a lot of people, they can, I guess I'm reading that they can access the February 18th show with our guest David Limbaugh on FringeRadioNetwork.com so they can actually hear it for themselves. But you sent our producer an MP3 of part of this show where Senior Pickles and Colin actually hacked into the show and they mentioned Roosevelt Jackson. So let's play that right now. Welcome to the first episode of the Senior Pickles and Colin Show. We have hacked into the audio feed to bring you this very important program. I would like to introduce my co-host, but I know very little about him. Do you want me to introduce myself, Hickey? Do not call me Picky. You can't introduce Colin without talking about his My Little Pony collection. Your little what? Pony! My goodness, did you not hear me? Ah, I may as well be chasing my tail. Did you line up a guess like I asked you? Listen here, Monsieur Cornichon. I was trying to get my friend Roosevelt Jackson to come on the show. He is a phony Bigfoot hunter, but I don't know if we should tell anybody that. And were you successful? No, but maybe you can interview me. I just heard that just now, Colin S. Collins, talking about Roosevelt Jackson. Can we play that again? I was trying to get my friend Roosevelt Jackson to come on the show. He is a phony Bigfoot hunter, but I don't know if we should tell anybody that. Okay, there. I just heard it again. Hey, producer, can you slow down the tape a little bit? Slow it down so that we can analyze this like they do on those detective shows. Okay, the producer's going to slow it down again so we can analyze this recording of Colin S. Collins talking about Roosevelt Jackson. Hey, roll it. Roll it right now. Well, that didn't really clear anything up, unless Jekyll Berry Jr. is actually Barry White. Play it one more time, producer. 
This time, normal style. I was trying to get huh? my friend Roosevelt Jackson to come on the show. He is a phony Bigfoot hunter, but I don't know if we should tell anybody that. Huh. That was very interesting. Gabe, what do you make of that? There you have it, Bruce. Colin admitting Roosevelt Jackson is a phony. And then a couple months later, he's on your show. <laughs> what kind of program are you running over there? Yeah, he was on the show a couple months later. You know, I'm not sure what that means, but I know it means something. Bruce, you're a genius when it comes to stating the obvious. Well, you know, I'd like to go out on a limb and say I appreciate that, Chad. So do you think Roosevelt is a reptilian from another dimension? Uh, I really think Roosevelt was a plant uh, who was put on your show by Senior Pickles to make you look bad, man. That was my second guess. Now, what kind of a plant do you think he was? Rosebush? Okay, focus, Bruce. You need to stay on topic. I will really have to investigate my guests in the future, I guess. I, You know, I feel annihilated. Mm, Bruce, don't you mean violated? Chad, this is no time to talk about flowers and your gangrene thumb. This is serious. Don't, don't you even vet the guests? I only went there once for loose bowel, and they told me they won't treat humans. What are you talking about? The vet. I was in the waiting room, and this lady stepped out, so it was just me and her dog. The dog got nervous and took a dump on the floor. The assistant came out, looked at the poop, looked at the dog, and then looked at me, and then looked at the dog again. And then I started getting nervous, but I held mine. Then she bent over and said to the dog, Did you do that? You know, I felt sorry for the dog, so I said I did it. Well, then what happened? She swatted me on the butt and called me a bad boy. Okay, we just took a wrong turn. I know. I wonder how that happens. You open your mouth. <laughs> well, maybe we should move on. Chad, do you have any news for us this week? As a matter of fact... I do. Wonderful. Veterinarian Tristan Rich in Melbourne, Australia, was credited in March. Speaking of veterinarians, Bruce, yeah, was credited in March with saving the life of a nine-year-old goldfish, Bubbles, by removing its brain tumor. Doctor Rich had had to first figure out how to keep Bubbles out of water long enough to operate but finally rigged a contraption to continually splash water over the gills. This was Dr. Rich's second heroic goldfish surgery. That is amazing. That's from Yahoo News. But, you know, that's the, a sign of the times, because that is dealing with DNA and trans goldfishinism. <laughs> I wonder how small his instruments were to do that surgery on a goldfish. Maybe he's a small person. That's a good point. Bill Bailey, not to be confused with George Bailey from It's a Wonderful Life, <laughs> a former nine-year employee of the Water Irrigation Network near Grand Junction, Colorado, was... <laughs> I, re I really need to stop reading these beforehand. <laughs> ...was awarded unemployment benefits in December for being wrongfully fired. The company claimed Bailey was insubordinate... <laughs> And that any complaints he had were merely because he is too sensitive to, to, this is in air quotes, he is too sensitive to workplace fun <laughs> and unable to forgive and forget his supervisor's team building spirit. <laughs> According to an administrative law judge, the fun Quote, included, unquote. among other things, detonating unannounced ear-splitting PVC <laughs> potato guns using golf balls and other items on the job. What kind of place is this? Here, it gets even better. And, ba and Bailey's boss placing his own feces in a bag inside Bailey's lunch pail. Oh, that's so gross. Hey, he just... He's just too sensitive. Where's your team building spirit? That's my feces. <laughs> oh. At one point in the hearing, during the boss's mirthful, carefree descriptions of the fun, the judge felt the need oh. to advise him of his Fifth Amendment right. Oh, man. You know it was bad then. For those of you who don't know what the Fifth Amendment right is, it's when you uh, could potentially incriminate yourself yeah. when you're giving testimony. 
Following the judge's decision, Bailey's two supervisors resigned. Wow. That's from the Grants Junction Sentinel. That must be a wild place to work. But the you know the fact that his supervisors thought this was like completely normal. <laughs> this is appropriate behavior. And they the were place. and they were like bragging about it during the trial. <laughs> <clears throat> Haven't they ever heard of a toilet? <laughs> Yeah, it was his lunch pail. I just put my feces in your lunch, that's all. <laughs> Come on. Don't you have any team's building spirit? You weren't going to eat that sandwich, were you? <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> North Carolina State University scientists, in a proof-of-concept study published in March, claim they have found a promising alternative for eliminating certain infections, even when no known antibiotic will work. The solution, the researchers write, is to genetically modify maggots, which are well known to feed naturally off of infected tissue, to gobble up the infections and release as waste human growth hormone. As they showed in the study, it could be done with a strain of green bottle fly maggots. That's from Science Daily. I'm just waiting for the return of the genetically modified leeches. I went to the doctor and he prescribed me some maggots. <laughs> this has the okay movie The Fly were... written all over it. <laughs> Where did he what? come from? <laughs> <What>? <laughs> that scared me. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I was like, I'm "Where fine. is that voice coming from?" You caught me by surprise. It's Gabe Reed calling back into the show. Moving on. <laughs> State officials have oh, State officials have notified retired pro wrestler Mary Thorne of Lakeland, Florida. Bruce, did you ever work with her? No, she she apparently was an independent wrestler for Florida Championship Wrestling. She mm. never she never made it to the big time and apparently from looking at her picture on Google, she was she probably played the part of a uh, backwoodsy big boned female wrestler. Well, judging by this article, her head hit the canvas <laughs> yeah. one too many times. That happens. Mary Thorne of Lakeland, Florida, that according to the law, her pet alligator Rambo, <laughs> age 15, they felt the need to give the alligator's age, <laughs> yeah. by the way, in the article, age 15, having grown to six feet in length, may no longer be kept at home unless she provides at least two and a half acres of roaming space. That's quite a bit of yeah. room. Yeah. She made a public plea in March, warning that confiscating Rambo would kill him. And he is super sensitive to sunlight, having been raised inside her home, and must wear clothes for seconds and, and, <laughs> and sunscreen when outside. And Although Thorne pointed out that he is potty trained and wags his tail when, <laughs> when needing to answer nature's call. Well, if he's potty trained, he's better than me. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. I think you really missed the touch point on that. Have you ever tried to put sunscreen on an alligator? <laughs> no, not that I can remember. Uh, it's not easy. So remember, when buying Christmas gifts for pro wrestler Mary Thorne, make sure you get a gift certificate at L.L. Bean for her pet alligator. <laughs> he likes the short pants with the elastic waist. <laughs> Seriously, though, this alligator is 15 years old and it's only six feet long? I don't think you can start that sentence as with seriously. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. <clears throat> At least he's potty trained. <laughs> don't forget sunscreen. Wags so does that tail. mean he removes his pants? <laughs> <laughs> the short pants with the elastic waistband? <laughs> he's been trained. Felicia Burrell, age 33, who crashed her car, killing her passenger. Well, that'll get it serious really quick, won't it? Yeah. After running a red light, fled on foot, and later tried to foil DNA evidence against her to avoid charges. <sighs> While in lockup, Burrell, with a 29 conviction rap sheet, knew a mouth swab was upcoming and tried to contaminate it by, as police later learned, having two other women spit in her mouth just before the test. 
<sighs> she was convicted anyway. And a court in Stamford, Connecticut, is expected to order a 10-year sentence at Burl's next hearing. First of all, she almost has as many convictions for her age. She's 33 yeah, and has 29 right. convection, convictions. So she's That's... not a, she's not a genius. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Do, not now here she didn't just have one other woman do it. She had two. Well, yeah, you know, you think about it. Now what's the DNA going to? It's going to be three people, right? <laughs> they probably call it Discovery Channel before they realize what happened. That's right. Hey, Gabe, thanks for thanks for letting me know about that issue with Roosevelt Jackson. I'm going to dig into that. I really think now I'm convinced that Senior Pickles is trying to sabotage this program. Unless the bigger it, issue is somebody is masquerading as Senior Pickles. I think that's the real issue here, yeah. not Roosevelt Jackson. Yeah, maybe I should analyze Senior Pickles' voice. That's a good idea. Yeah. You really need to get your show under control here, Bruce. It's getting out of hand. I think so. I think so. Well, maybe our guest tonight can do that. Up next, an atheist homicide detective turned Christian. That almost sounds like a Jerry Springer. <laughs> okay, let me, let, me, let me compose myself here. Okay. <laughs> if I can. Up next... An atheist homicide detective turned Christian, J. Warner Wallace, the author of God's Crime Scene, joins us in a moment. How much of a geek are you? No, seriously, do you think you're a Star Wars expert? Well, take the hardest Star Wars quiz in the world and find out. Go to ZippyCheese.com and see how well you know the Star Wars movies. There's a quiz for the original trilogy, or, if you dare, take the quiz for the prequel trilogy. What's the name of the creature in the trash compactor in Episode 4? What was the name of the curator of the Jedi Archives in Episode 2? Go to ZippyCheese.com, take the quiz, and share with your friends. There's also a Marvel comic book quiz. Do you know obscure Marvel comic book characters? We'll find out today. That's ZippyCheese.com. And joining us this week, I'm very honored to welcome Jay Warner Wallace. Jay Warner Wallace is a cold case homicide detective, adjunct professor of apologetics at Biola University, Christian casemaker and author. Jay Warner was a conscientious and vocal atheist through his undergraduate and graduate work in design and architecture, CSULB and UCLA. He always considered himself to be an evidentialist. His experience in law enforcement only served to strengthen his conviction that truth is tied directly to evidence. But at the age of 35, Jay Warner took a serious and expansive look at the evidence for the Christian worldview and determined that Christianity was demonstrably true. Jay Warner's professional investigative work has received national recognition. His cases have been featured repeatedly on NBC's Dateline, and he's been awarded the Police and Fire Medal of Valor Sustained Superiority Award. Relying on over two decades of investigative experience, Jay Warner provides his readers with the tools they will need to investigate the claims of Christianity and make a convincing case for the truth of the Christian worldview. Wallace is the author of Alive, A Cold Case Approach to the Resurrection, and Cold Case Christianity, A Homicide Detective Investigates the Claims of the Gospels. His latest book, which we will be talking about tonight, is God's Crime Scene, A Cold Case Detective Examines the Evidence for a Divinely Created Universe. You can find out more information about J. Warner Wallace at his website, coldcasechristianity.com. J. Warner, welcome to the Bruce Collins Show. Hey, thanks for having me, Bruce. I appreciate it. Well, it's great to have you on. Now, can you take us back to the time in your life when you were an atheist? What happened to you personally that changed you into a believer in Jesus Christ? Well, I was the kind of person who um, was really um, hesitant to step off into anything that I didn't think I could be demonstrated was true in some way. And when I asked my friends who were Christians, 
um, they really didn't have great answers for why they believed the Bible was reliable or why they believed the resurrection was reasonable. And these were guys who were police officers at the time. I was 35 when I first got interested in looking at this. And most of my friends just really didn't have good answers. And I think that was one of the things that put me off. It. And a lot of the people, we, you know, I kind of knew two different kinds of Christians I ran into in my professional work. One were the officers who were great evidentialists about their professional life, but didn't really seem to apply that skill set to their you know, religious beliefs. And then I knew uh, Christians who we arrested. Uh, who would claim to be Christians, and, and of those two different groups, I didn't see much reason to step off into a direction toward Christianity when it didn't seem like it, would, it had people in it who, number one, knew why it was true if it was true, and then people who didn't seem like they behaved much differently, even though they were Christians. So I just was not interested. And that's one of the reasons why I spent so much time as an atheist. And I, For me, it all turned when I started to look... You know, I had, by the time I started looking at the Gospels, I did have a skill set as a detective that helped me to evaluate eyewitnesses. So I was able to kind of apply that skill set to the Gospels to see if I should trust what they said about Jesus. And that's really, people will say, well, you know, do apologetics ever really get anyone in the kingdom? Do apologetics ever really lead to anyone to the Gospel? But for me, they did, because I just had hurdles I had to jump that were, I, I kind of put this hurdle in place myself, but I needed to have someone show me why this was true evidentially. Before we talk about your latest book, God's Crime Scene, can you give us an overview of your book, Cold Case Christianity? What can people find in this book? Well, that's really the, the book that I wrote that kind of charted my own investigation of the Gospels. So when I first you know, had a pastor interest me, um, and I had never been really in an evangelical church growing up, and I, you know, we didn't have people in my family who were, who were Christians, so I had never really had that experience, and so I had a chance to go and visit a church, um, and, and this pastor was just smart enough to throw Jesus in a way that I could catch him. You know, he, he pitched him as a smart, ancient sage. At the very least, you should at least, you know, kind of check out the words of Jesus. He was clever in the way he introduced me to this idea, and so, I uh, began to examine the Gospels, and that's what I wrote about in Cold Case Christianity, using this template, this four-part template that we use when we evaluate any eyewitness. We ask these you know, 14, 13, 14 questions that jurors are, are told to ask in their head as they're examining eyewitnesses here in California. And um, I used that same principle, as just four basic categories. You know, were they actually there to see what they said they saw? Can they be corroborated in some way by outside evidence? Uh, can they be uh, determined to have never changed their story? Have they been consistent, honest, accurate over time? And finally, do they possess a bias? These are the four categories that we use to determine if someone's reliable. And as I applied that to the Gospels, I wrote about it in uh, Cold Case Christianity. Uh, now, your new book is God's Crime Scene, A Cold Case Detective Examines the Evidence for a Divinely Created Universe. If we look at the universe as a crime scene, what are the types of evidence that would be measurable in this case? This is basically the, the, the approach. Uh, you know, I, I realized pretty early on working death scenes because homicide uh, detectives, we get called out to all kinds of death scenes when the officers aren't quite sure if it's a murder. And there's four ways to die. You can die by accident, by natural causes, by suicide, and, and finally, of course, by a homicide. And we got to figure out when we first get there which of these four is most reasonable on a lot of the evidence in the room. And it's really a game of playing you know, inside or outside the room. Can we determine, can we account for everything inside the room of the death scene by staying inside the room? If we can explain everything by staying inside the room, then we probably don't have a murder. We probably got a natural, an accidental, or a suicide. So, for example, if the guy's laying there on the floor and there's a pistol next to him, but, but that pistol belonged to him and there's a note there that he wrote in his own hand on his own stationery, well, then I can explain everything in the room. I got no sign of anybody else being in the room except for him. All the fingerprints, all the DNA come back to him. Well, now I can explain everything in the room by staying inside the room. That's his room, his gun, his paper. On the other hand, if I get there and I, I discover that the gun doesn't belong to him and it's got foreign DNA on it and there's no note and there's bloody footprints leading outside the room. Well, now I've got things that I cannot explain by staying inside the room. The better explanation, in fact, is outside the room. And that's when everything shifts. If, if you can't explain the stuff in the room by staying in the room, you've got to consider the reality of an intruder. 
and that changes a death scene into a crime scene. And so I thought, couldn't we apply the same thing to the universe as a system where we said, hey, can I explain everything I see in the universe, and I think there are eight important pieces of evidence we would look at, by staying inside the room of the natural universe. If I can do that, then I don't have to invoke any kind of divine uh, causal agent or intruder. I can just, you know, some sense of space, time, matter, and the laws of physics and chemistry will get everything done. We'll explain everything in the room. If it doesn't, well, then we've got to consider something outside the natural realm as the better explanation for everything we see inside the natural realm. And if that's the case, we've got a cosmic level intruder. And so I took this approach of playing this game of inside or outside the room with the entire natural universe in this book we call God's Crime Scene. Mm -hmm. Now, when we ponder the beginnings of our universe, what types of evidence can we gather? Well, if you think about it, I mean, this is a crime scene or a scene that we're going to investigate, and it has a beginning. So that sometimes, you know, where the crime occurs is important to us. How did, you know, this is a crime scene that wasn't there. Is it not infinitely old? We now know from science and from several pieces of evidence I list in the book, and we've known this for a number of years, that the, the, the best explanation for the universe is that it is finite. It has a beginning. What I mean is that all space, time, and matter has a beginning. And that beginning, it comes from nothing. And when I say nothing, I mean no space, no time, no matter. And, and so the first cause of a universe that has a beginning is the, really the explanation that all of us are looking for. And even as an atheist, I, I recognize this. And there are lots of atheist cosmologists that also recognize that the universe has a beginning. And so they're trying to figure out what could cause that. It has to be something, though, that is non-spatial, non-temporal, non-material. It has to be, remember, the universe, everything in it came from nothing. And unless you're willing to redefine what nothing is, we've got a, a situation where the best explanation is something outside the universe that is non-spatial, non-temporal, non-material. And that, that really takes you in a direction that is uh, disturbing for a naturalist like me as an atheist who didn't think, uh, you know, nature is space, time, and matter, but now I've got to find a cause that is something extra natural, something other than the natural elements of the universe I was so used to considering. You know, this is a, a, a strange thought, but I've noticed that it's popular nowadays for some people to suggest that maybe we came from aliens. And But when you think about it, who created the aliens? There has to be somebody before that. But but beyond that, if you had second life on another planet, wouldn't that make it even more miraculous? It, granted, it's miraculous now, but wouldn't that make it even more miraculous than it is now and further point to a, a, an intelligent designer? Well, I think one of the pieces of evidence, one of these eight pieces of evidence we're looking at in the room come down to four major categories. So I've tried, I could have done 12 pieces of evidence, but I thought these eight were significant. We have a universe that has a beginning, a universe that shows signs of fine-tuning for the existence of life. We have the uh, origin of life, which you're talking about, in the universe, all life coming from non-living uh, um, elements or, or uh, precursors. And, and then you've got the appearance of design in biology, so the life that does emerge has the appearance Appearance of design. You've got conscious beings, so consciousness has to be explained inside the universe, and free agency has to be explained inside the universe. And finally, you've got objective, transcendent moral truths and the problem of evil. These are things that all of us have a duty to explain. And so, in the past, where we might have said, "Well, you know, you Christians and theists, you all want to posit a God that we can't see, so the burden of proof is on you." But here's what it really comes down to: in crime scenes. All of us have to explain the evidence that can be seen in the crime scene. And I have a burden to explain why I think my causal suspect is the true causal suspect. And my partner, who may disagree with me, he also has a burden to explain why he thinks his causal suspect is a better candidate. So in the end, all of us have to explain these eight things. And if you think that naturalism is the cause that could explain this through some process of either chemical evolution and then organic evolution and, and by 
biological evolution, whatever you're going to posit your cause is, then it's, the burden is on you to show how this can explain. So I think in the end, when we look at the, uh, the problem with origin of life studies, and we've been doing origin of life studies for over 50 years, they really aren't, we're not any closer. As a matter of fact, the more we drill down into the nature of life, the nature of what is required to, to get life started, the more kind of chicken and egg problems we discover, mm-hmm. the more um, we've got a problem with um, information. We used to think that somehow we could ground everything in the basic physics of the universe, but it turns out that life is grounded in the information we see in DNA. And if that's the case, we've got to find a sufficient cause for information and it turns if you think about it i mean i would just just say to the person who thinks this can happen naturally show me how physics and enough time for physics to do its work can ever produce the kind of information we see in dna our experience of the universe and of all of history tells us that information always comes from intelligent sources and physics cannot produce, you know, the, the book that I wrote. It takes a free agency and an intelligent mind to write any book, to write any, any just to have a conversation which you put a sentence together. So the, the problem we have is if, if all of biology is grounded in this precursor of information, then we've got to explain who is the author of life, who, who is the source, what could be the source if it's not a who. And that's one of the problems I see, Bruce, is that I see that, that naturalists who are working in science are good at asking a lot Lots of questions, the what, the why, the how, the when, the where questions. What they refuse to ask is a who question. Mm-hmm. So in the end, if you're only willing to ask the first five of the six questions, but you're never willing to ask the who question, you find yourself with really kind of deficient answers that are kind of circular usually or don't have the kind of explanatory power they ought to have. Why? Because you refuse to ask the who, and you might want to ask a who if the thing we're trying to describe, to describe information, is only we've got only one history ever of a source of information, and it's always a an intelligent who. So you might want to ask a who question once you discover we've got information in the system, but that's what they refuse to do, and that really ends up leaves us in a place where we can't really sufficiently answer the question because we're not really asking the right questions. And we're speaking this week with Jay Warner Wallace. He's the author of God's Crime Scene, A Cold Case Detective Examines the Evidence for a Divinely Created Universe. Now, your book explains very convincingly how there's a delicate balance in our universe that cannot be by accident. And you discuss these facts by addressing the foundational, regional, and locational conditions of the universe. Can you dissect that for us? Yeah, I try to start every chapter in the book because I I realize this is a book that's going to take readers through the physics and the science and the philosophy of these different categories. And sometimes that can be pretty daunting, you know, to to walk into those kind of deeper scientific issues or philosophical issues. So what I try to do is to bring it back so the, the jury who's reading the book can see it in the context of the kinds of things we ask jurors to do all the time in criminal trials. So I start every chapter with an analogy from a real criminal case, a homicide case, then I turn that corner and show you how that 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 approach we took to solve the case also explains the evidence in the universe. So, for example, when it comes to the fine-tuning of the universe, it really comes to tampering. And I had a case one time where we had a woman and a child who were murdered in a, their home, and it was done by way of tampering with the um, the gas line so that the pilot was out and they basically officiated in the house because of the, uh, natural, you know, the gas that was pumped into the house, and all the windows were closed in a certain way, and the, the doors were closed in a certain way, and, and the clothing was pushed up against the crack of the door, and then the one pilot happened to be out just the way everything, the, the gas was turned on the day before. All these unique situations had to occur, and I noticed that there was a kind of, kind of some foundational backstory to the crime that let us believe that, that you know, there's probably a suspect in mind who has a, an evil intent for this woman. There was regional stuff we saw at the location of the house, and then we got in really tight locationally to the room and we saw how all these things had been tampered and it was the overwhelming cumulative nature of the foundational conditions the regional conditions and the local conditions that really brought us to the point where we said we've got to explain this this cannot be an accident that this many coincidences do not line up this has clearly been tampered with and so we opened a homicide investigation on this when we discovered her body well the same kind of thing is happening in the universe you have foundational conditions that are so amazingly fine-tuned 
that the laws of physics of, of, of nuclear forces, of, of magnetism, of, of gravitational forces are so amazingly fine-tuned that just the smallest razor's edge difference in any one of these cosmological constants will result in a universe in which life simply cannot emerge. As a matter of fact, in many of these models, the universe doesn't even last very long because the constants have to exist in a very, very razor's edge fine-tuning. And the cosmologists who do this work, including the atheists, will argue that it doesn't have to be this way. There's nothing about the physical nature of these constants that requires them all to be lined up. They can theoretically imagine any number of universes in which the constants are very different. So it's not as though this is just the way it has to be. And there's a lot, of, a lot of atheists who are looking at this issue are trying to figure out, well, they recognize the fine-tuning, and in order to explain it, one of the most popular ways of explaining it is to offer a multitude of universes, a multiverse, in which there are an infinite number of universes, so therefore you shouldn't be surprised that one of them looks like ours. The problem, of course, is there's no evidence for the multiverse that would give us, and I'm not even sure you could think about how you could measure something or identify something or confirm something that's outside the natural universe in which we live, but that's put beside the point. But what they recognize is the fine-tuning problem. How do you explain this? Fine- As a matter of fact, the fine-tuning of the universe was one of many things that ultimately led the atheist Anthony Flew to abandon his atheism for a form of deism because he just felt like the fine-tuning of the universe and the fine-tuning of DNA was just too much to explain from some natural process. Hmm. It's interesting that you mention Anthony Flew because I just interviewed Gary Habermas. Good. who debated him uh, several yeah. times. Now, uh, your book discusses the complexity of life around us. That's a pretty compelling argument right there of an intelligent designer, isn't it? Well, one thing for sure, we do have a certain amount of complexity, but complexity in and of itself can be explained in terms of often just through some natural physical process or through the random physical process. It's the specificity within the complexity that is so um, really requires us to, to kind of stand up and say, how do we explain this? And, and so we often will uh, you'll hear people say that there's good evidence for design in biology. And one of the things I wanted to do in this book, because my background was in design and the arts and in architecture, and I thought... You know, I, we all recognize certain features when we see them that we would say are best explained by the existence of a designer. And I wanted to help people kind of identify, well, what are those features? Well, I won't go through all of them t- tonight, but, but what we have here is we have, you know, a, a series of, of, of about eight different design features. And when you see these things in any object, you have good reason to believe it's designed. And then I try to show in the book how we see this also in molecular machines in uh, biology, in both in our own bodies and in the bacteria and in other organisms. We see signs of molecular machinery that has all the earmarked, trademark characteristics of designed objects. And so the question then becomes, how do we get these kinds of objects if the only things available to us in the natural universe are space, time, matter, and the laws of physics that govern such things? Can we get this kind of specified complexity with just um, unguided mutations that are being acted upon by um, natural uh, conditions in the environment, natural selection? Can we get this kind of complexity? And so the complexity itself is remarkable, but it's even more remarkable and really hard to overcome from a kind of a naturalistic perspective is the kind of specificity that we see in these eight attributes of design. Now, in your book, God's Crime Scene, you talk about uh, consciousness. Explain how that's sort of a monkey wrench for the accidental universe theories. Well, well think about it for a second. If, if, you, if you have um, a, a, just nothing to, to work with aside from the physical elements of the universe and that we are creatures that are entirely, you know, if you're an atheist, you believe that the universe is entirely physical. There are no immaterial realities like minds. There are brains. We can get this physical thing, given all the physical elements of the universe, space, time, and matter, and also physics that govern material things, and we end up with uh, brains. But what is this immaterial thing we've been calling the mind? Now, a kind of consistent, um, honest atheist like Sam Harris would argue, and he's got a background in neuroscience, he would argue that we don't only have minds. We have brains, but the minds are really illusory. Now, again, in the same universe, 
in which we have this uh, mysterious thing called con consciousness that somehow emerges through the long process of evolution and emerges out of this lumpy gray matter we call the brain. Something immaterial emerges. Now, this is why this is called, from a naturalistic perspective, you can look at the literature, you'll see it referred to it often as the problem of mind or mind-body problem. And the reason why it's a problem is how do you get the immaterial mind from the material body, from the material brain? Now, if, this, if, if atheism is true, uh, we only have, like I said, those things to work with, space, time, matter, and the laws of chemistry and physics. And then you've got to ask yourself the question, well, okay, if everything in the universe is purely physical and material, then we have physical uh, events that occur, like dominoes in a sequence, one triggering the next, and then ultimately we have a, a, these causes, which are caused by prior physical causes, result in some end. But we seem to have an immaterial train of thought that seems to be our own. It is not being caused by prior physical processes, but we seem to be able to intercede and make choices and violate the kind of domino uh, chain and say, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm just, and, but if atheism is true, you really can't do that. You, you don't have a free thought. What you have is an experience in your brain caused by prior physical processes of neurons firing over which you have no control. So you think you have freedom, but that's an illusion. And you thought you made a decision about whether I'm saying what I'm saying is true, but you didn't really. You were just destined to believe that based on the row of dominoes that were bound to fall in a certain order in your in your brain. So you see the problem with this. Under atheism, I don't have two things that I really need to have in order to be reasonable. I need to have conscious thoughts that I can have some free agency over so I can make choices between two options when reasoning through any set of circumstances. But if, if the physical universe is all there is, you're stuck with something called determinism, in which all physical processes fall in a certain way, determining an outcome, and you have no choice in the matter. So you are bound to either agree or disagree with me, but don't think for a second you're making a free choice if atheism is true. Now, it turns out you could borrow from theism the very thing you need in order to be reasonable, which is the free agency required to reason. And it turns out all the things that I valued the most as an atheist, you know, reason and creativity and love, and I was a cop, so accountability, culpability, these are all things that are hinged, they are dependent upon free agency. You can't be creative if it's just determined to, to come out this way. You can't love somebody unless you love them freely, you have the freedom to cho choose against them or choose for them. These things genuinely require free agency. But as an atheist, I, did, I, I believe we had the free agency, but my worldview does not give me proper grounding for free agency. And that was the problem. Jay Warner Wallace joins us this week. His website is Cold Case Christianity. He's the author of Alive and Cold Case Christianity, and he's got a great new book, God's Crime Scene, A Cold Case Detective Examines the Evidence for a Divinely Created Universe. Now, what about this idea of objective moral truth? Where does that come from if there is no God? Where does the evidence take us? Well, I think sometimes what we're inclined to say, you know, I've never said that, that atheists can't behave morally. As a matter of fact, we often see atheists be, behave as morally or more morally than some of the people who believe in God. Mm -hmm. The question, of course, is can they ground their moral behavior? Do they, and is, does their worldview provide a, a foundation for this or a source for this? If, 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 if we're going to say that all moral truths reside in individuals, that's going to be a problem. If we're going to say, well, no, they reside in cultures, well, then two cultures can disagree about something. What's going to adjudicate over that? If we're saying, well, the United Nations adjudicates over cultures, so we're saying that just the, 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 the most number of people who agree determine if something is true. If that's the case, we better all bow to countries that are bigger than us because they have more people to agree on these things. If we're going to say, well, no, uh, moral truths emerge because uh, to behave in a certain way actually benefits the species in some way, that really, I think, is a stretch, and here's why I say that. Um, if, if there's a group that is, I don't think any group in the history of, of, of living, of the history of humanity, has cared more about the species than they have their own group. As a matter of fact, if you think your group is the best group and you want them to emerge, you might do any number of bad things in order to defeat the other groups in your own species. 
this idea that we embrace moral truths. Where do, how do we get altruism? How do we get sacrifice? The problem we have, it seems to me, is that the best grounding, there are some things you'd have to agree, transcend all of us. It's never okay to um, torture babies for fun or to steal for fun or to kill for fun. If you add that expression for the fun of it at the end of any claim like this, any act, you will discover there's a transcendent, objective, timeless principle that transcends every people group, every point on the globe, every point in history. And so the question becomes, if laws are grounded in a source, what kind of source could account for transcendent, objective values that are true even before there are people in place to recognize they're true. These are values that actually have to precede us. And so the best place to ground, and also remember that morals are not just morals. We're talking about moral obligations. We have moral obligations that we sense. And moral obligations are, not, are always between persons. I am not morally obligated to my police car, but I am morally obligated to my partner and morally obligated to the people in my city. Moral obligations reside between persons. So if there is a set of objective, transcendent moral truths, what or who really is the objective, transcendent moral person to whom I'm obligated? That's the problem here. We recognize we have, we see these objective, transcendent truths, and we recognize that they are between persons. So the problem is, you know, how do we ground these unless we're willing to recognize the existence of an objective, transcendent moral person? And who would that be? That would be God. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now, the Bible addresses evil. It talks about Satan. It talks about demons. And we know today that there are real Satanists out there who exist. And we've all heard of very evil actions by people like Hitler or Charles Manson or a whole lot of other people. Is the presence of evil the evidentiary smoking gun? Yeah, there's two kinds of evidence, right? There's inculpating evidence and exculpating evidence. Inculpating evidence is the evidence that inclines us to believe that a particular suspect did something he shouldn't have done. But if he has, a, for example, a um, an alibi where he says, no, I, I might look bad for these three or four reasons, but I was out of town that night, and I've got proof I wasn't even anywhere around. Okay, well, now that's a piece of exculpating evidence that actually inclines us to think, well, he couldn't have done it. So the question is here, I could point to seven things in the universe that I think are most reasonably explained by a supernatural creator God outside the universe, but then we have this nasty little problem of evil. Is evil and the existence of evil an exculpatory uh, piece of evidence that actually eliminates God? I don't care how good he looks for the other seven pieces, evil eliminates him. How can there be an all-loving, all-powerful God? when there's evil in the universe. Either he's not all-loving, because he's not trying to stop it, or he's not all-powerful and he can't stop it. But if he's allowing this, he can't be all-powerful and all-loving. So now your definition is gone. Now, what I, I try to offer in the book a framework, because I work acts of evil. That's what I do for a living. And I can tell you there's been some terrible acts of evil I've had to work. And families have said, why did that happen to my little girl? Why did that act of evil occur? And I have to go back and say, well... The stars, and before I was a Christian, I would have said the stars had to align in a certain way because if she hadn't been there that day and she hadn't said yes to this and she hadn't done that to that and, and there hadn't been a guy of that nature who wanted to hurt her and, and he hadn't had the opportunity and the car to do it in and all that stuff, if all those stars had not been aligned perfectly, this never would have happened to her. Well, it turns out when we looked at any act of evil in the universe, I think there are several reasons why God might actually allow the act of evil to occur. In the same way I have to put together the stars and how they aligned properly before I was a Christian to explain any particular crime in my city, I think we have a duty to look at the, I, I point out seven different uh, factors that I think God weighs when allowing any act of evil and figure out what God is trying to achieve in that moment. Now, this is going to be hard to do because, remember, we don't have, I, I have a hard time getting into the mind of my killers, fiddle, you know, let alone trying to get into the mind of God. So this is going to be tough to do. But I think that the, these seven things are reasonable and as you consider them in the book, I think you'll see that they give you a template by which you begin to understand, okay, one thing for sure, there is no incompatibility with the existence of an all-loving, all-powerful God and evil in the universe. One thing does not eliminate the other. And I think that's the first thing we have to understand. And then we have to try to piece together why God would allow any particular act of evil. And I hope that the template I've given you will help you kind of walk through that process. 
The book is God's Crime Scene, A Cold Case Detective Examines the Evidence for a Divinely Created Universe. The author is J. Warner Wallace. The website is coldcasechristianity.com. J. Warner, thank you so much for joining us this week. Oh, I'm so glad to be here. Thanks for asking me to come on your show. Thank you once again for joining us here on the Bruce Collins Show, where we broadcast every Thursday night at 10 p.m., right here at WWPR, 1490 AM. Remember, God loves you. We do too. Don't give up.